Hi, this is Rob Wiltsey, founder of Schoolshine. We make custom, professional quality videos for school districts. We want to make sure your district has the very best video content possible and the best content strategy so you can get the most out of your videos. So check out some samples at schoolshine.org and schedule a call with us today to learn how you can take your videos to the next level. That's schoolshine.org. Do you wish that creating and sending email newsletters took less time and effort? Would you like more parents to tune in and read your district's newsletter? If so, try MarketVolt, the email newsletter platform tailored for districts like yours. With MarketVolt, it's simple to create newsletters that parents will read. MarketVolt automatically customizes your newsletter to match each parent's interest. With MarketVolt, you can create better newsletters with less headache and less hassle. Visit betterk12newsletter.com to learn what MarketVolt can do for you. That's betterk12newsletter.com, powered by MarketVolt. Hey there, PR experts. Blackboard here. School PR is about telling the story of your students, your teachers, and your school community. From websites and mass notifications to mobile presence and classroom engagement, Blackboard has the tools that you need. And whether you're a one-person shop or part of a bigger communication team, we can help you reach more people more effectively in less time. Thank you for all the work you do in improving education and helping students succeed. And thanks for letting us be a part of it. Now, back to the podcast. Advocating for public education, sharing our stories, and celebrating our schools, students, teachers, and staff. From crisis communications to media relations, social media, and everything in between, we're here to give you the best strategies, tools, and techniques to help educators help our kids. Welcome to the School PR Podcast, brought to you by Blackboard, School Shine, and Market Bolt. Here's your host, Ryan Ferran. All right, welcome back to the School PR Podcast, everyone. This is episode 43 and a very special guest today. We are thrilled to have Dr. Joe Sanfilippo, the superintendent in Fall Creek, Wisconsin. He's a co-author of several books, among those Hacking Leadership, The Power of Branding, Telling Your School Story, also National Superintendent, PhD in Leadership. Joe, the list goes on and on and on, my friend. How are you doing? Thanks for joining the podcast. I'm doing great, man. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate the, appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, I love what you've been doing. been following you a long time on social media. And uh, just give us a little bit, Joe, just first a background about your school district and uh, your your role within it and how you became superintendent. So so this is uh, my 10th year in Fall Creek, and it's, like, it's my ninth superintendent year. Um, and it's just been an incredible experience for – uh, for you know everybody, but all from I should say from my perspective, from our family's perspective, it's just been wonderful. So we came here ten years ago, and I took over as a principal in the elementary school, and then in the next year worked into uh, the superintendent role. And the thing that was really interesting about the process to me was, you know, I think we always wanted to, my family and I always wanted to run, get to a smaller school district and something that we could, you know, call home and that kind of thing, and make sure that we had our kids in a district where, you know, we could get a chance to see them all the time. And uh, and so when this job came available, I think we kind of looked at it and thought, well, that might be an interesting, you know, interesting move because we weren't that far away. But then we got here and people just blew us away. Like the amount of pride that was in the school district already was fantastic. And, and so when we came in, and moving to superintendency, um, I was the fifth superintendent in six years. So, you know, I think coming into that role, it's like there's a there's probably a lot of trepidation that people would have in terms of taking on something like that. But after being here for a year, I mean, you could just tell that it didn't have <laughs> anything or had little to do with what was going on here. It was just a lot of outside factors taking part, which is the reason that it got moved on so many times. And there was just really incredible things happening here. I think the problem that that people were finding themselves in is that the people here just didn't know how great they were or great they could be. They were already doing really incredible things. So for us to really figure out ways that we could celebrate their work and build the build on the capacity that was already here, you know, that was honestly pretty easy. It's just about talking about it at that point. So that's what we've been doing and trying to get our message out there. And everybody else in our building, um, you know, has really kind of owned pieces of what that looks like. And I guess, you know, I've 
I couldn't be happier. Um, if I'm, if I'm going to be a superintendent, like this is the place to do it. I'll tell you, cause it's not a fun job all the time, <laughs> but this is a, a place that makes it a lot easier for sure. So was that the difference for you, Joe, is the, just telling the stories and being the voice? I mean, uh, superintendents, I think the averages, they last 3.1 years or whatever that stat is. And so five and six years is obviously something's, you know, not connecting there. So what do you think the big difference, you being there as long as you have now, was? Uh, the biggest difference easily is that, you know, we just keep the, the thing that we keep in mind is that when people don't know what you do, they make up what you do. And when they make up what you do, it's not what you want them to make up what you do, because often they make up what you do based on what their experience was in school 25 years ago. So our job was to try to figure out how we can tell stories in the right way for our people and make sure that they feel valued. But at the same time, when you're telling the school story, you're also telling a leadership story too. And that mentality of people don't, when people don't know what you do, they make up what you do isn't just a school thing. It's a leadership thing too. So our job was to try to figure out ways that we could be in a position where we could tell stories on a regular basis and make sure that people know and understand what we, what we were doing so they didn't have to make up what we were doing. And that was a really important first step to it is, you know, being intentional about about what that storytelling looks like and, and never giving up the opportunity to say something great about your school and then building and then opening doors. We, we take it out in three different capacities, being intentional about the work that we do, opening doors to make sure that people outside of our world can look inside our world and building each other up because a lot of times we try to do this world work alone and we can't do this work alone. So be intentional, open doors, build staff has been our, our you know, just kind of our mantra moving forward. And we've seen, uh, I think we've seen some some real success with that. Not individual success. It's just a lot of real team success that people have been able to do some really incredible things based on the fact that you know others know who we are. I love it. That's one of the foundations of the School PR podcast. We're all about you know telling your own story. And one of the big strategies for school PR in general is just if you're not telling your story, like you said, somebody else is. And if they're doing it, who knows how accurate it is. So why not take control of your own story and tell it? I love hearing this from a superintendent because sometimes that, that's hard to imagine. And sometimes when uh, a board or a superintendent gets the pitch of let's add a communications person that, oh, maybe we can use that. But it sounds like communications, transparency, sharing those great stories, and another factor of when you start sharing your story is you boost morale so much because you're celebrating students, you're celebrating your staff, and the morale and the culture boost is amazing. It seems like communications was a big piece of your you know, change strategy coming in. I, I think it absolutely is one of the biggest pieces of what we added was just making sure that our story was out and known. I mean, let's really let's think about this honestly, right? Like, there's no reason that a guy from Northwest Wisconsin, you know, who, a superintendent of a school district of 850 kids in Northwest Wisconsin, should be talking to you all across the country. There's no the only reason that you know about what's going on here is that we talk about what's going on here. So, you know, that mess the messaging of you know, it, you know, if you don't tell your story, somebody else will is, is really important. At the same time, the other piece of that is when you tell your story, you give license to everybody else within in your space to tell theirs as well. And a lot of times people don't want their story told because they don't think their story has value. And when you can create value for the people in the space so their story can be told, then you then their colleagues realize that their story has value as well. So when we create value and tell the story through the eyes of the kid or through the eyes of the adult in this space, we gain a lot of momentum for other people telling the story when it comes to this work. Yeah, it, just so many good points there. I just want to give people a little bit more about you real quick uh, so they understand your perspective. It's, it's amazing. What you said is so true about I wouldn't know who you are right now from a hole in the wall if you didn't take on communications, if you didn't embrace social media, if, if you didn't start telling your district story. There is no reason I should know uh, Fall Creek, Wisconsin right now. There is no reason. But you're a national superintendent. You're a national superintendent of the year, by the way, and a national figure because of your communication strategy sharing the cricket story. That's just remarkable and speaks so well to the power of communications and what it can do. 
all these people now all over the country know you, know your students, know your staff. So what I try to explain to you know districts I work with or talk to and at conferences like you do is communications is not just about celebrating yourself. You're recruiting teachers and staff. So like there's a teacher shortage in this country. I don't know how bad it is in Wisconsin, but in California it's terrible. So many states in the country it's terrible. But if I know Joe and Fall Creek, Wisconsin, and you have a teacher job, I know you're innovative, I know you celebrate your staff, guess what? That's going to be one of the first places that I apply to because I, I know about you and I know the great things you're doing. You may be doing great things in District X, but if I don't know about it, I'm not that intrigued to imply. Same thing goes for declining enrollment. Most districts in the country, I don't know how it is in Wisconsin, but declining enrollment. We need students to come in. So when the family starts Googling stuff on different districts in Wisconsin, if I can move to Joe's area near Fall Creek, guess what? I'm going there. They're doing innovative stuff. The teachers love working there. So the power of communications is not just about let's get stuff on social media. It has real impacts on education and students bringing in the best of the best. And then that's not even talking about helping with parcel taxes and bond measures and getting in funding to your community too. So there's so many components of it. Which are some of those that you've noticed some of the most benefits from? Hmm. So the first one I think is like I didn't know a lot about Fall Creek before I came out here, and I had been in this area for five years prior to it. They had some two really really good basketball teams a couple of years before I had gotten here, so you can see some of that stuff in the news. But uh, I didn't know where it was, and I lived ten miles away, and so uh, that was the first thing that I've know that I've seen is this is that people now know where we are and it's so fun when people are driving like on a major highway between madison wisconsin and, and minneapolis and st paul there's a fall creek exit you still have to go 20 minutes to get to fall Creek or 10 minutes to get to fall creek but i'll get pictures from people that are just on that road just taking a picture of the of the side and say hey we just passed you and waved at you i have no idea who these people are but they still do it because they've heard about about who we are, you know, and I think that that provides value because now, like, when our people go to conferences, when they go to bigger events, they're, they're noticed. Everybody and people know who they are. If they're wearing anything that has Go Crickets on it, like everybody knows who they are, and they want pictures and they want to talk about what they're doing in their classroom. Like they just walk around like rock stars at these events, and they are. They should. They deserve to be. They're that good at what they do. And then the other thing is the financial component of what's happened since we did start telling the story in, in the way that we're telling it. And, you know, in 2012 was like the first year we started being real active users when it comes to a social perspective. And in, in Wisconsin, you, there's open enrollment in Wisconsin. So, which means that you can go to any district that you want as long as you can get there. Okay. So, and, and financially, it's a $6,000, you know, you get $6,000 per kid that comes into your district on open enrollment. So in 2012, we had 45 kids leaving the district to go somewhere else, right? And we had 60 kids coming into the district. So we were netting, you know, 15 kids and 15 kids at $6,000 a piece is $90,000. So it's, you know, it's, that's a teacher right there. And, and, and plus like a teacher and benefit package and everything that goes along with it. So fast forward to last year, two years ago, 2018, we had 60 kids leaving the district and we had 150 coming into the district on open enrollment. So that's oh. now you're netting 90 kids yeah. at six grand a piece. That's a half a million dollars in a nine million dollar budget. Like that's all our budget is, is nine million dollars. And you have an influx of, of five hundred thousand dollars. You don't have to reduce programs that you would have to reduce if people weren't there. And it, it does make it a little bit tentative in terms of how it works from year to year because those kids could pull and go anywhere else. So there's an expectation that we do things the right way. But at the same time, it has allowed us to continue the programming when if it was just resident students, we would have gone from 850 to 700. And that would have had a tremendous impact on our financial stability. That's just such an amazing example because in California, I know sometimes there's probably – 50% of the school districts have a communications person paid on staff. Some have bigger staffs, etc. But not every school district has it. And often when it's proposed, you hear, well, that could be a teacher position. That could be X position. But when you break it down financially, this person, this role, is one of the few roles in the district that can actually bring in income directly and indirectly through their work. So a $100,000 role 
maybe a hundred thousand dollar role that could go to a teacher but this hundred thousand dollar role could also bring in potentially millions of dollars like you just said in your example and then we can hire 20 teachers so the right. the math and the short-sighted thinking of that and you know i know there's more politics that play into it but I love your point about, and I, I know it well, but I love hearing it from a superintendent perspective that, look, this role, yeah, it's going to cost some money and some time, but what it can do on the back end is just amazing. And you're seeing the growth directly and have the data to, to back up the efforts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. And if people get jacked up about, you know, like us, you know, we, we work with social schools for EDU, which is an amazing company in Wisconsin. Andrea Gribble and her team have just done unbelievable things over 70 schools in the state of wisconsin alone that they're working with and they're because you know a lot of people can't can't afford a you know a we're a nine million dollar organization we have a hundred people on staff we have 60 teachers on staff i think sometimes you have to be creative in terms of how you're you know telling that story or bringing people in to tell that story and andrea and her group have been absolutely phenomenal with a lot of the small school districts in the state of wisconsin because of the way that they, they, you know, they get the message out there in the right way. So I think that when you think about like, what does it cost? What does it cost us mm -hmm. to bring in a group like that to take care of all, literally all of our social posts and monitor, right? Mm -hmm. And take a look at the comments and make sure that everything's scheduled. Like they do all of it. Yeah. And that's been really helpful, uh, for smaller districts like ours that, that may, may not have had that opportunity and we fund that through the opportunity that we get through the numbers that we bring in yeah and I know so for like smaller districts there's that same argument maybe like oh should we spend money on a PR uh -huh. consultant so you have to go back and forth but look you're the I was talking to my superintendent uh, we're going through the whole coronavirus stuff which we'll talk about in a minute but he's like I don't get how these superintendents and districts do this without a communications person like you don't have time to check social media when you're trying to communicate to your families and staff about school closures and what's coming and distance learning. Like you don't have time to do that. You're the superintendent. So spending money on a on a PR firm that can do this and then the residual effects you get from it is just so worth it. But I know that argument exists and people have been blocked from hiring communications consultants because of that. But it just obviously it doesn't make sense uh, to you and I. So, Joe, well, I do. I do think that I think that that helps that process is making sure that the people who are making that decision can see the immediate benefit of what goes on. So let's say you're talking to the school board like our school board. They may have been a little bit hesitant on the front end to do this. But the thing that happens with school boards all the time is that the school boards school boards deal with the three B's of education and only the three B's of education beans, buses, balls. If it doesn't have anything to do with beans, food, buses, transportation or balls athletic they don't hear about it so if you're always taxing your 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 board with beans buses balls and that's all that they hear about they don't even want to come to meetings right <laughs> but if you find a way to tell the story in the right way with the right people telling the story now people are still going to wonder about beans buses and balls but they're also going to have the conversation on the front end about the story that was read on facebook this morning at eight o'clock or the conversation that happened in the in the classroom or the, the concert that we streamed or the game that we streamed, whatever, they'll talk about that. They'll still talk about the other stuff, mm -hmm. but they're going to at least have some benefit, you know, emotionally, like so a deposit emotionally before they have to get to all the garbage that they deal with. Yeah, it, and it's a lot. And uh, I know Andrea Gribble, she does great work. Follow her on social media. You, so you got a good school PR mind right there working for you guys in Wisconsin. She knows her stuff for sure. Absolutely. And uh, she's been mentioned on this podcast several times. She's got great ideas and appreciate collaborating with her. Uh, so one of the things how you kind of really blew up is uh, the one-minute uh, walk-to-work leadership challenge videos. Those are amazing. All right, everybody, Saturday morning, Fall Creek, Wisconsin, one minute walk to work, and here's what I'm thinking about. How did that uh, idea come to you, and how did it grow from what it was to where it is now? It's amazing. Yeah, well, thanks. I, I, don't, I really don't know. I honestly <laughs> don't. I, I just started putting some thoughts together on, um, you know, just on videos. I was walking to school in the morning, and, the, you know, the, they, they started to be get a little bit more popular, and then, 
a little bit more. And then it actually, what ended up happening was there was, uh, you know, people would say, this was great, this really helped me in this. And then I thought, well, that sounds fantastic. Let's continue to do them. And I was coming to work anyway on Saturday. And I, I come to work on Saturday and then early in the morning because my family's still sleeping. And it gives me a chance to get some stuff done when nobody's in the office and not not wake up my family too. So, and the fact that I live right across the street from school is clearly helpful in the situation, right? But so I just started doing them, and and I think you know I, sometimes there were once a week, and then there were once every other week, and then you know whatever. I just feel like if I'm if I got something to say, I'll say it. If not, I'm not going to make one up just to make it up. So they've just been pretty authentic in that. In that, you know, here's a couple of ideas that can kind of, um, you know, move you forward, always practical stuff that people can take away and not feel like it's one more thing on their plate. So, yeah, they've been fun to do. I, I find it, you know, head on, it's very interesting to me that, that they've taken off the way that they have, but I, I'm not going to try to figure it out. I'm just going to keep doing them if people like them. So for people, we have a lot of listeners in California so when they hear you say you have a one-minute walk to work, they're right now saying he must have said something crazy because we spend <laughs> we spend an hour on the 405 to get halfway to work in Los Angeles. So you literally live a minute away from your school district. Yeah. So what I did was we when we moved, when we moved into town, my wife's brilliant, right? So when we moved into town. We started looking at houses in town and what every house was, you know, the average house in terms of what it costs. And we bought, we bought one that lower on the lower side of that, that, uh, was right across the street from school. And we thought that, you know, first of all, people know where you live no matter what. Doesn't matter where you live. They're going to find out where you live if you're the superintendent. But the second thing is if we're, we're in town, we're right across the street from school. We live in a house just like everybody else lives in. And we're part of the community. We're embedded in the community. So I walk a minute to school every day. My kids walk. My my kids, I, some days my kids are late. And I want to say, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> like, you live across the street, man. But they but they are. It's ridiculous. Uh, and uh, we just, yeah, so I walk a minute. It literally, those one-minute walk to work videos um, are actually more like a minute 45 because i got a little bit more to say. I, I pass one door. Because it used to be I was just walking to school and then I just do them and now, now they're a little bit longer. But I, I pass a door at a, about 58 seconds that I could just walk into. <laughs> so I can literally be out of my house and into our building in like 58 seconds. I'm not sure if I'm happy for you or mad for myself and the rest of the world. That <laughs> that's amazing. Does anyone I'll ever? You, if here's the here's the problem though, Ryan. The other side of it is that there you can't take a day off. Like there's no. If you decide that you know what, I'm going to take the day. I'm going to get the yard cleaned up. I'm going to you know mow the grass, that kind of thing. Just make sure everything's cleaned up and everything. You can't. You simply can't do that because if kids are in school and they see you across the street, they don't care that your contract is different than somebody else. They just know that you're not at school. Does uh, Tommy's mom ever just say, like, where's the superintendent and show up at the front door? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, a couple of times in the first year that they would show up. And I get a lot of calls, hey, can you open the building real quick? And, I, and by I say a lot of calls, <laughs> if I get called once a week, I would be surprised. But, you know, I get 20, 30 calls a year saying, hey, do you mind opening things for us? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely, I can do that. So we've made some sacrifices as a, as a family. But there, but at the other side is the benefits are just so big. You know, I mean, I everybody knows who the kids are, and you know, and and that's that can be. There's some pressure that goes along with that. But the other side is that you know, hey, it's it's okay that everybody knows who you are. Kind of a keeps you in line, and b does give you different opportunities that you might not have. So you can take the bad stuff and and just deal with it. We just like suck it up, man. Like there's some good things that happen here. What is it like, the dynamic of having your own kids in your own district and with teachers and discipline and they got to, oh, man, I got to discipline the superintendent's kid? This, right. is, this is not going to go yeah. over well. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, that, it's the, the, well, the thing, uh, we I'm blessed to have three beautiful kids that, that don't get into a lot of trouble. That helps a lot. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at the same time, there, we don't, I don't do any, I don't do anything. When it comes to kids, are my own kids in the district? I don't go to any conferences. I don't. I don't. And I've we've just chosen that uh, that my wife will handle all of that stuff. And so for two reasons: one, I don't want to be sitting in a third grade class and and have the teacher feel like, well, I have to you know 
develop all these standards that I should or show that I'm meeting all these standards and blah, blah, which I would hope that they wouldn't. But, you know, I can understand how they would. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is that it really gets uh, my wife more involved in the day to day stuff. Like right now, you know, the stuff that we're going, that's going on right now, she's at home with uh, with the kids um, and doing all of their work or with them and that kind of thing. And I don't have a lot to do with that. So there's that's good for me. I'll, I'll take that all day. But. Um, yeah, there's good and bad that comes along with it, but it's the best decision that our family's ever made, you know, being, being part of this community. Yeah, my superintendent reminds me a lot of you, and he also has elementary kids in our own district, and he's innovative, believes in communications. He follows you, too. Uh, I advise everyone to follow you on Twitter. It's at Joe underscore San Filippo. Uh, over 50,000 followers. Your LinkedIn's amazing, too. It's where you post all those uh, leadership challenge videos. Uh, but I know it's a, it's always kind of a, it's not easy. You have to be a strong, firm leader to have your own kids in your district and okay. allow teachers to do their job. And, uh, so that's also another, I hope your board appreciates all this you're doing. <laughs> you're doing. Do. Oh, goodness. Yeah. And Ryan, here, the thing about the board, honestly, without question, is that none of this happens without the support of the board. Like, we don't get a chance to go speak to different groups or go to conferences or do, you know, that put our stuff out there if the board isn't supportive of the work that, that we do. I have been so incredibly blessed to work in this district uh, with a board that right now has just been incre so supportive of the work and they see i think they see the other side of it too and i think one of the things that i, that I would tell superintendents to do or communications directors to whoever the case may be when these fantastic things are happening outside of your district find ways to get the board involved in these things and so like so like when i go to a conference now a lot of the bigger conferences that I'll go to if I'm presenting at the conference, one of the things that I'll try to write into the contract with the conference is that um, I want, you know, two registration and, and travel for, for two people, two of, my, two of our teachers, that we can come and take them. And they get a session to present, like, right after my keynote. So now if, we, if I do my job in the keynote, that people are going to get excited to hear our story and, and follow up on it. So every time we've done that this year, we've done it in Boise, Idaho, and Michigan, and we've done it in Illinois in the past. And I think the it, when they walk into a room and it's full, and we've done it in Nashville and Florida, I mean, we've done it in a lot of places. And um, when they walk into a room that's full and people want to hear their story because they've, they're excited about what's happening in the school district, then the board gets excited about that stuff. So we also had two events this year that were local that I knew that I only decided I only accepted to do because I knew that board members could be at these events. They could drive to the event. So it gave them an opportunity to see, you know, what happens when we go out and how excited people get when, when we go out. And when they see that, it makes it easier to, you know, say yes to the conference or say yes to the, you know, you know, bringing people in or whatever the case may be. So that uh, that's a big deal is to make sure that the board, the decision making body feels like there's benefit to whatever it is that you're doing, because they don't always hear about that when they leave the boardroom. Such a great point. We are blessed with an amazing board of education here, too. And Superintendents know this. A board of education can make or break a district. If you uh -huh. if you want to be a risk taker, or be innovative, you need a good board to support you. And man, we are on the same page. We have an amazing board. But I love your point of bringing the board along so they can see it. Not only telling them, but they can experience it. We do the same thing with our board as often as we can. Bring them the conferences. When we go and speak, can we be there? Or when we know they're going to the California School Boards Association statewide conference for school board members, past few years we've been submitting to speak at it so then they can go and see so then they experience what we're experiencing they see the collaboration firsthand they see us networking with educators in wisconsin and all this that we wouldn't normally do that's a direct benefit so your point of getting the board involved is just oh that's such a good point because they experience it they feel it they see the morale for other teachers and stuff and because pd is one of those things joe that you know that gets questions too should we really be spending thirty thousand dollars to send teachers to a conference but if they can go to the conference and see the benefits firsthand wow that's a game changer oh yeah because it creates the connections for them moving forward and when you have when you have a vested interest in that event 
then you're much more likely to take it serious. When we take people, and but I, the other thing that we that we talked about when we take people from Fall Creek to out to these events, we're taking the people that are doing incredible things. You know, I think that that's a big thing. It pushes everybody to know that you'll get a chance to go and do this stuff if the things that are happening in the classroom are innovative enough to be talked about on a regular basis outside of here. And and our our people have done a phenomenal job with that. So they're always trying something new, and and I think that they're doing that for a couple of reasons one is they want to go to the conference <laughs> but that's not the, that's not the heart of where it is. it's 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 built into their core and their core is the trust that they have in their colleagues and the trust that they have in themselves to try stuff and not feel like they're going to get slammed for it so i love this quote that i came across in an article when i was doing some research on you i don't know who it was to maybe your school board uh in 2011 from when you were i guess being considered for superintendent uh-huh. I might not be the best superintendent you're going to hire, but I'm the loudest person on earth. So if there are good things going on here, people are going to know about it. Tell me about that. Yeah. What could stunning professional quality videos do for your school district's PR and communications? Find out how School Shine's professional video team can partner with your district at schoolshine.org. This podcast is also brought to you by MarketVolt Email Newsletter Solutions, providing industry-leading email newsletter solutions that better connect over 800,000 parents, staff, and community members with their school districts. Learn more about MarketVolt at BetterK12Newsletter.com. Blackboard believes in the power of good communication in helping students succeed and is a proud sponsor of School PR with Ryan Ferran. Blackboard. Education's partner in change. Now back to the podcast. Yeah, that's well. I wouldn't advise anybody do that in the boardroom. <laughs> yeah. you know, like, but it also it's one hundred percent true. I'm not the like, at 2011. I hadn't been a superintendent at all. I wasn't going to be the best superintendent that they hired at all. I mean, anybody with more super, with more experience is going to be better than me. And probably you know the, it, the it's the same thing now though, Ryan. Like I'm not the best superintendent. Even in this area, my gosh, I'm just really super loud. Like that's what I do, and I just shout out about the work that happens here. There are, there, there are so many. Oh God, there are leaders that are so much better, and it's people that I really look up to. And I think that the thing that we need to consider about that is that the opportunity that we get to tell stories from this place is a privilege. And if we're not taking advantage of the privilege by getting better, then we're really short sighting not only ourselves, but the process in general. So it's a it's a challenge to you know, knowing people know what you do is I believe a challenge. And it's not something that you can sit down and say, okay, well they know I think we've arrived and moved on. Because the minute that you feel that, you're gonna get passed up by a lot of people. And I never want our group to feel like they got passed up because they're the, somebody else's leadership decided to, you know, uh, talk about them more or give them more opportunity or whatever. Like it's our job to provide the opportunity for them to get better, and we're going to do everything that we can for that. And it comes, it actually starts, you know, with being really loud about the incredible things that happen. If there's a superintendent listening that their district hasn't really embraced social media storytelling, they haven't done much of that. What are some of the strategies that you're obviously on social media and stuff like that, but you also want your staff, your teachers to embrace it, share their own stories. What are some of the things that you do to enable your staff to start telling their stories, your story, uh, Fall Creek, Wisconsin as well? I would tell the first thing that I would tell them is make sure that you have a central location where everything can be posted to. So it ends up being a, um, you know, a, uh, you know, a, a story with a bunch of chapters as opposed to one event that just got a lot of play. So like for us, everything that we do goes to the go crickets hashtag. Everything goes on our district uh, website. It goes to the Facebook page, to the Twitter account, to the Instagram feed. All that stuff is taken care of through the go crickets hashtag. And every time that we can shout out about that, hashtag and get that out for people we're going to do that so that's the first thing that i would say is make sure that you have some sort of some sort of specific um you know place in all of your social feeds that that people can can come back to so anytime you want to come to you know if you want to see the one minute walk to work on Twitter, it's all archived under one hashtag. Same thing with all the Go Cricket stuff. It's all archived under one hashtag. And that would be the first thing that I would do. The second thing that I would do is 
don't feel like you have to like be all things to all people right away. You know, it, sometimes I'll talk to superintendents and they'll say, well, I started really hot on Twitter and then I got really busy and then I haven't really touched it in like three weeks and I'm waiting for the next break so I can learn more about it and then I'll do some more. And what I tell them is, well, don't do that because the next break is never going to come. Like you're going to get something that's going to fall on your plate. Like just decide that you're going to set a goal for yourself of tweeting out three things a week and be done with it. And then if you don't get to three, but you get to one, it's better than zero for two more weeks. So like think honestly about what you're doing. And, 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 you know, if you go into a classroom as a superintendent and you check in on a class, you know, if you're there for 20, if you're there for 30 minutes, be there for 28 and a half minutes and then spend a minute and a half sending out a message about what you saw in that space. Like you're, mm-hmm. it's the same thing with the PR person that we were talking about before. You know, it doesn't, it, you know, does it take some time? Absolutely. But does it get you to a point where you can create more social capital about your work? Absolutely. That it goes back to that leadership piece of it where, you know, when we talk about schools and telling the story of schools and that when people don't know what you do, they make up what you do. It also is for leaders because when people don't know what you do as a leader, they think that you sit in your desk all day and and sign papers or whatever they think you do. And here's the other thing that happens with superintendents right now. I'll tell you this, superintendents are the highest paid people in their district. And if people don't know what they do, then they don't become a leader anymore. They become a number. And then people start asking the question, well, you know what, for that money, we could get three <laughs> teachers and two A's and Chromebooks. Like, what are we really doing here? Mm-hmm. And so for the, the thing that has happened with me in the superintendent lens is that nobody guesses about what we do. And I'm actually on the other side of it. Like when I'm out and doing something different, people know that I'm out and doing something different because the, because people are, everybody's tweeting to go crickets hashtag when I'm at a conference in Idaho. So <laughs> I've got the other problem on the other side of it. But you know, if you can take some time to just put your stuff out there, you're going to find that there's a lot of momentum moving forward with it and uh and it gives you some social capital for when something goes wrong because you're going to screw something up there's no question that you as a superintendent are going to 100 percent miss on something right i'm looking outside right now it's snowing right it's <laughs> snowing right now it's april whatever nine and it's snowing and i just want like so it makes me think of snow days like you're going to screw up a snow day well if you don't have any social capital and people don't know what you're doing then when you screw up the snow day because you thought it was going to snow and then it, then a quarter of an inch came down and you could have like you know got to school then people don't say well i can't believe he got can you believe what he did like are you serious like what what are you paying this guy all this money for he can't even call a snow day <laughs> like you know develop the social capital along the way uh there's so many good things i want to follow up on first of all yeah was that your daughter that tackled you in the the snow day cancel video yeah that yeah, was in- she does yeah she does that, that she in- thinks she's super funny that was incredible she's taken yeah, after thanks. her father clearly yeah, uh, that's right. She doesn't want to talk about it anymore. Now she's in middle school. She won't even talk about it. I thought, Daddy, don't come into my classroom. I do not want you in my classroom. Uh, I'm like, all right, sounds good to me. That's funny. But the uh, yeah, you and you obviously clearly can't hide because everyone knows where you're at, and if and if they don't, they can walk across the street to your house and make sure. Yeah, that's all you're, true. <laughs> you're over there. Uh, the social capital. It's such a good point. When I speak, I tell people, look, when you're telling your story. If the only time they hear about you in the news or on social media is Joe screwed up this, he screwed up the snow day. If that's the only time they hear about you, then six months later, Joe screwed up another snow day. All right. But if they hear 80 positive stories and then superintendent uh, Joe screwed up a snow day, it's like, you know what? I've seen 80 things that that guy's doing, so he screwed up a snow day. Who cares? The social capital. So I'm telling people, keep telling your story because guess what? A crisis is going to hit. Something not good is going to happen and you're going to be in the news and you're going to have to deal with it. If that's the only time they see you in the news is bad, 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 that's not good. But if they see all this stuff, your social capital, like you said, Joe, is so high that their, their, their willingness to forgive you and understand is like, yeah, like that wasn't, that may not have went well, but man, they're doing 80 other things that I saw this month in the newspaper too. So the social capital piece is fantastic. The The self-branding part too for superintendents is like, that's just a indirect factor and a benefit of social media. It's like, wow, this guy does do a lot. This guy is in classrooms. He is meeting with the board. He is at events. So 
the transparency of it and celebrating everyone else is great, but kind of an indirect impact is, man, you're self-branding. They know you're at all these different things. You're in teacher classrooms. You're you're meeting with the board. You're meeting with the unions. Like it's just smart for your a career profession to do some self-branding on social media. Let people know your thoughts, your strategies, and what you're doing. Uh, so I could not agree with you uh, any more on that. That's just such a good strategy. One thing we do in our district. <clears throat> to get more buy-in so we're not the only voice as a district is we spend a lot of time, especially initially when I got to Arcadia about six, seven years ago, is a lot of training for staff on social media. A lot of districts, um, especially we're finding younger, I don't know how it is, I'd be interested in your opinion on this, Joe, is when teachers are coming out of college now, there's a kind of a thing to stay off of social media. You may, you know, may hurt you getting a job and just we're kind of shocked to find that a little bit. So even the younger teachers coming in were staying away from social media. So when they came first job, there may be in mid twenties, they didn't really, they weren't too familiar. Uh, you would think young people, social media go hand in hand. So we did a lot of training when I first got here, we would train principals on social media, how to use Twitter's staff training. So we invested a lot. We also unblocked Facebook and Twitter from all the you know networks at the school. It's like, you want to be on there, collaborate, go ahead. You want to spend five minutes talking to a friend, who cares? Yeah, we know the absolutely. benefit is, is going to outweigh it. And then with our new educator academy the past few years, so every summer you bring in your new teachers, your new staff, get them through a few days of training. But in even in that new educator academy, we're doing a social media training right away. So day zero, they're already on social media. They know how to use Twitter. They know how to participate in our uh, our chats on Twitter with the district, tag other people, share their stories from the classroom. So you, it's one thing to be out there, but also enabling your staff, training them how to use it right way, wrong way is also a big piece for us. What do you guys do with the staff piece and enabling them and working with them for social media and telling your story? Uh, I think we've been really, we try to be really organic about it. Um, and I think that, you know, we've never required anybody to be on social, but what ended up happening is that with our colleagues were, and they saw the benefit of what how it was going on with their colleagues and they wanted to jump on it right away. So we've been trying to run it through one person just to make sure that the story gets out there. And then when they're ready to be part of this, that social atmosphere, then we'll, then we, sit down with them if they want we just tell people if you want any help with it like we're always here for you we can set up you know a, a different opportunities but it's better one-on-one -on -one right now if you want to just have a conversation we're here for you so just let us know what works best for you we we found you know when it comes to when we hire people in the district um we don't actually do a lot of hiring now that i think about it uh, usually if they're hard to reach areas but um well, I think most of the time when people get here, they tend to stay, which is, which has been good. Yeah. But when we do that, uh, we just, I just tell people in the interview process, like, I, make sure that before you step on campus that your social is scrubbed to a point that, you know, when other people are going to go look at it, they don't see you, you know, you know, what was going on in college. And it would have been a different situation for me too, had there been social media when I was in college. But we just tell people that this is an opportunity for you to make sure that, that the right message is out there. And please understand that if you're the new kindergarten teacher and you've got these five-year-olds walking into your class, their mom, their dad is going to be on social figuring out who you are. And you got to make sure that that's the right person that they want to see. So when they get there, we try to help them with that process if they want. But a lot of times it ends up being, um, you know, classroom pages or grade level pages, and then their colleagues do most of the most of the training for that. Yeah, <clears throat> Joe. If social media was around when I was in college, you would have just seen me in libraries and at museums and yeah. just study groups. So you know. I heard this sounds like sounds about right. <laughs> me too. Yeah. Me too. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Lots of study right. Groups. Uh, so we're proud because we've done trainings and all that. We want to get our staff on, but you're right too. You can't push if they're not comfortable. You don't want to push them out there, force them out there. But we've seen such a growth through the trainings over the years. We actually proud to say that we have every superintendent on Twitter, every board member, every principal, every assistant principal, and I think it's now over 300 staff. So even if we don't have the district voice that we put the time and investment early on, with our educators who want to use social media to train them, 
we could take a month off and you can still go on Twitter and, and social media and see amazing stories from our teachers and staff directly in their classrooms, their departments of what's happening. Um, so I think that's important to, if your staff's ready, you got to invest that time in training them and getting them going. But the uh, benefits on the back end are, are going to be huge. I, I agree. And I think when you're in a bigger situation like you are, I, I wholeheartedly believe that there should be some formal uh, training when it comes to what looks like what it looks like on social. I mean, when we're talking about we're talking about, you know, we had 60 teachers and <laughs> and 40 other staff members that may or may not be invested in it, but that's probably as many kid, people as you get in annually. So mm -hmm. that's that's it's just a different conversation. I, I do believe that if your if your district is large, having some sort of regulated this is what it could look like, should look like, and if you want help, we're here for you is definitely the best practice so transitioning i will wrap it up soon i just want to uh thanks so much for your time i appreciate it perfect transition i was watching one of your recent um leadership challenge videos the one minute uh, walk to work and you were talking about how a middle school teacher in with the whole coronavirus school closures and everything now most of us in the country are going to some form of distance learning but your middle school teacher was telling you like this is, you know, normally I wouldn't probably do this stuff, but this has helped me. I was having a conversation with one of our middle school teachers this week, and he was saying how he would much rather have kids in school, but this has given him an opportunity to try some things that he probably wouldn't have tried if they were in school because of the day-to-day -day craziness of school, right? And the thing that struck me about the conversation was, at the end, he said, you know, this is probably going to make me a better teacher for when they come back to school. <laughs> so, so the leadership challenge for next week is simply this. The situation we find ourselves in is not ideal, but there's never been a more ideal time for us to try new things because we can't do this wrong if we continue to stay connected to kids and those who care for kids. While this is not a pretty situation for any of us, there are a lot of silver linings with pushing ourselves to try new things, to be innovative for some teachers that may not have used some of the software and been early adopters. Man, they're pushing themselves to help students what they've always done and doing it in ways we haven't seen before but we're seeing some great benefits. Tell me what you're seeing there uh, in Wisconsin with this. Well, the, the thing about the, about the conversation that I had with that middle school teacher was that, you know, that we have to keep in mind that a lot of the stuff, just connecting with people is a new innovative practice when it comes to how they have to connect with people. So, so where, wherever they're at, I think the thing that we want to make sure people know is that wherever you're at, you're at. Like, don't try to make an excuse for why you've never used this or tried this or wanted to do this, but you couldn't have the time, that kind of thing. Don't ever, don't do that because there's no, there's, that's just a waste of breath at this point. Let's figure out what you want to do moving forward and how we can, how we can help you with that process. And I think the thing that we need to do as leaders is understand that our reaction to this situation is going to be the reaction of the staff. So if we walk out every day going, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to kids, I can't believe it, I can't believe we have to deal with this, they're going to feel that way too. I don't mind having that conversation with a select few staff members in the building. And I had one yesterday. I said, you know what, I don't like this. I just really don't. I don't. But at the same time, how we deal with it is going to be the way that our staff deals with it. And so we do things like, you know, every morning I'm, you know, reading a – uh, a story to kids on our Facebook page to start the day and doing some magic tricks and some things that are just bad magic that they figure <laughs> out and they call me and they're like, you're not magic. I saw you. So <laughs> they, but they, it gets them there in the morning and it gets them talking about it. And I wouldn't have done that in the past, but now that we're doing it, not only is it giving parents a half hour to just break away from the day to day craziness that they've now had to schedule, but it also, um, gives, it gives me some, tremendous amount of joy because I know people are going to be watching these things and I know that they're going to laugh at the at the at the uh, magic trick and then I get FaceTime calls after the magic trick saying I saw what happened I saw it you're not magic but that keeps that family engaged every day I get a call from one family every single day one FaceTime call and this little girl gets on there and she's like I saw the coin I know what it, where it is I know it and I couldn't, and I just smile and laugh and say, no, you didn't. I'm magic. I don't know what you're talking about. But guess who comes back the next morning as soon as she wakes up? She does. 
And so that gives me joy that I'm in that spot. The other thing is at the end of the day, I, I've been calling all of the kids on the birthday list and, you know, whose birthday it is. And I spend a couple minutes just tell, you know, telling them happy birthday and that I would have loved to have said happy birthday to him in person, but we couldn't. And I hope you have a great day. And so I start my day and end my day with a lot of joy and things that I was, wasn't doing prior to this situation happening. So I tell our, we're telling our group, find a couple things that bring you joy in the day. Otherwise it ends up being incredibly isolating for you as a teacher, you as a staff member. And when it gets isolating, it gets lonely and nobody wants to be in a place where they feel like they're alone. Joy equals engagement and engagement is key. So I love those ideas to get, to get the joy and engagement there. Cause when I've, everyone knows when kids are engaged, their success goes way through the roof. And uh, the the bad magic, that's like the new uh, bad dad joke. That's amazing. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The magic tricks are really bad. Yeah. They're really, really – it's still snowing here, Ryan. I can't even tell you. I'm looking out windows. I'm like, this is ridiculous. It's oh. – oh, my God. Anyway, I wish I could make that disappear, but whatever. I won't I won't tell you that it's going to be uh, 70 here in Los Angeles next week. You so. just did. You just did, Brian. I was here. Yeah. You just said it out loud, man. That was my yes, bad that was my bad magic trick right there, Joe. That's right. Good job. I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, yeah, if you got any more, send them my way, man, cuz I'm running out. I've been doing I did 15, I've done 15 days of books right now. I got no magic left. I mean, uh, today I just put a hole in a dollar and called it good, man. Like that's all I did. I'm sure the kids loved it. So so we're at coronavirus update going on 18 right now. We're a mostly Asian school district. We have a lot of travel to and from China with our families and students. So we've known about this since our first update actually went out, Joe, at the end of January, talking about the oh, wow. coronavirus. And so we were probably a little bit ahead of people, which was good. So <clears throat> what has kind of been, so now we're, we started, you know, a few weeks ago, we're closing school for two weeks, then it got extended to May, and now just recently we're shutting down for the entire school year. Now we're working on distance learning, uh, finalizing what that's going to look like for our district, and then next step is graduation prom. What are those events going to potentially look like? Uh, so it's been, an, it's the past two months have felt like two years, a day's worth of work, it feels like nine weeks, and it's been, I'm, I'm a former news reporter, and I was telling people our, our board on our board meeting, our virtual board meeting, that I've never seen a news cycle move so lightning fast, change so rapidly in my life than this. And it's not social media, it's just the nature of a pandemic. I'm watching our local mayor on the news, our governor on a conference call with the county of education. Things are moving so rapid. We're trying to keep up and form the community. Uh, it's been a whirlwind. Our staff has done amazing, but that's kind of the progression where we are. Now we're on spring break. Everyone's sort of taking a break, um, but we're planning to be closed the rest of the year and focus. Schools are physically closed, but we're still working with kids, educating them. Where are you guys at with school closures and the COVID-19, and how's that process been for you guys? So we were... Um... I think we were a little bit more prepared than a lot of people to go to the distance learning option. And it actually had more to do with snow than it did with coronavirus because the last couple of years we've had so much snow and so many cold days that, uh, it impacted our, uh, the number of minutes that we had to, oh. to, you know, use and what we had to do in terms of like adding minutes to the end of the school year or whatever. So the at the beginning of this year, we told our staff that we're going to have three days of flexible learning days or, or virtual learning days, and we need them to create a platform that they would have three general lessons, uh, three days of general lessons on that if we were to be out of school for a significant amount of time, that the kids could have a couple of days to, you know, uh, have work, continue work, and then you would continue to support them from home. And we, then we could count the minutes for the state mandate, right? So we had those platforms set up and, uh, we had a couple, and then we also had, uh, before we went off on our, uh, time away, it was the 18th of March was our first day out. The 16th and 17th were spent in school having conversations with kids about all the platforms and actually doing online school while they were in school. 
So they went to all the sites. They did all the information. We posted the, the, the grades or posted the, the information there and the assignments there. And then they worked through those assignments with somebody in the room to make sure that they could get to where they needed to go. And then at that point, we just, that, that was the work part of it that we felt really good about. And so when we started, when we got out of school, our first priority was making sure that kids had what they needed to, to be connected to school. Uh, was it food? Was it a, a connection to a staff member? Was it a, was it landline or was it, um, uh, was it internet access? Whatever the case may be. Cause we're in rural Wisconsin. So I mean, this, there's, it's not, you don't have a lot of, it's, it's, it's pretty spotty from time to time. So, so we made sure that all of those things got out. We got hotspots to the people that needed hotspots. But most importantly, we called every kid in the first couple of days just to make, to ask them two questions. How are you doing and do you need anything? And if we can answer those questions the right way, then we know where our kids are going to be. I told our staff that two things are going to come to the surface really, really quickly with our group. And the first is, uh, you know, how well do we know our kids? And the second is, what are we willing to do for them when they're not here? And I think the thing that we have to consider is that if we didn't know what the kid needed when they're gone, we didn't know the kid very well when they were here. So we had to make sure that we had we could reconcile that and try to fix that situation. And that, that was very few and far between. And the second piece is just making sure that or, or thinking about what are we going to do for them when they're not here. And our staff has just like absolutely been incredible in terms of what they have done for kids when they're not here. You know, bringing stuff to kids or making the calls to the kids or doing the FaceTime with the kid or whatever, whatever it is, just making sure that they feel like they're part of the, the group and that they have a connection to school, which continues to be our focus. Um, you know, this focus for the remainder of the year is not going to be a strong academic focus at all. I, I, you know, I can, I'm not even, and I'm not even going to apologize for that because we, the expectation is now different when it comes to what schooling looks like for the remainder of the year. If this was for us for the remainder of life, we'd have to come up with a couple of different opportunities. But right now, it's give them a daily learning opportunity, make sure that they're connected to school, answer any questions, make sure that they're safe and they have food, and then move on from there. Yeah, we're finding, as we're working through and finalizing our plan, we've offered optional stuff right away. As soon as schools got out, our, our coaches did a great job of getting here stuff that you can do, and teachers started pushing stuff out as soon as possible. We are finding kind of what you alluded to. Some parents are wanting, like, why can't we just do block schedule period one through eight online? And I don't think they understand it. And we're trying to let them know, like, we got first responders, our teachers have kids. Like, it, it's not possible to do for two months. And... Uh, it, it's it's tough, so that's a part of our messaging. Um, so I'm with you. With, uh, I think a lot of people are, but I think some parents don't realize why you can't just do one through eight online like you did physically on campus. Yeah. What are you guys doing for grading? And well, yeah, right now we're not taking a look at from a, a K eight perspective. We're really not doing a lot when it comes to grades mm -hmm. and. Um, and we're just making sure that we can connect to the kid and that they can get some work done. At the high school level, it's a little bit different because we don't want a lapse in – if we move to a pass-fail, is that going to impact the GPA moving forward? And so I, we, we're still trying to come up with what the right answer is for that. I don't know what the right answer. The expectation for a, a, an A is certainly different on you know February, on, uh, April 9th as it was uh, – than it was on you know January 15th. Mm -hmm. So – we're just trying to work through that and, and provide the best opportunity for kids um, to maintain what they've had uh, and certainly not lose anything in terms of their GPA uh, moving forward. So we're, we, I don't know what the answer is to that right now, Ryan. I wish I did. Um, but we're trying to get through the third quarter, which actually ended yesterday. And, um, and then we'll deal with the fourth quarter as it comes along. So. Yeah, I may send this to some uh, some of our parents and folks. If one of the most innovative superintendents hasn't figured it out yet, give us some time as well. Because that's the thing. Everyone wants answers right now. But, again, this is so fluid. We don't have all those answers. I like what you said about pass-fail, too, because that's been considered in our state, especially it was mentioned with one of the governor's press conferences, that that's an option. But one of the things we're thinking is a negative with pass-fail is, Everyone's concentrating on seniors, but what about the freshman, sophomore right. who that GPA may be impacted in three years? And so there's there's so many factors to consider. So that's why we're um, 
hoping everyone gives patience as well as we're trying to figure out what's best for kids, not just now, not just the seniors, for everybody in three years from now, tomorrow, and the like. Yeah. So it, it's a process, and there's state agencies you got to work with, colleges right. you got to align with. So there's a lot to it. Uh, yeah. I, I'd throw pass fail at the high school seniors tomorrow, like because they're they're done. like they got they got, they have like four weeks left. They're not gonna right. For, for us, we're at like what is this April 9th? Our kids graduate on May 23rd. So I don't know what you know with that group, but. The, but the freshmen and the sophomores who, you know, are going to be in a different spot in a couple of years when they're trying to get into the college. And even colleges right now are going to pass fail. And then everybody says, well, why don't you just go to pass fail? Because the colleges are going to pass fail. They're not going to pass fail on entrance opportunities. Right. That's not what they're doing right now. They're going to pass fail on the people that are already there. What about the kids that want to get there at some point and need the grade point average to get there at some point? Change that. This, if this changes their mentality mm-hmm. from a you know post secondary uh, you know institution, I'm all for it, and I'm all for change, changing what we do. If they're going to change what they do too, because I just don't want our kids to be impacted if they don't have what that next level is looking for. Exactly. That's what. We're not doing this in isolation. We're doing it to get kids to another entity that we don't control. So we got to align with them and prepare our kids and make sure that's a sequence with college and where they want to get to. So that's a lot. How bad is um, coronavirus cases in Wisconsin right now? Is it um, where are you guys at? Yeah, it's not not the numbers aren't huge in our county. There was I think 15 in the county right now. So we're not we're not at a huge number right now. Uh, but that number has climbed substantially in the last couple, in the last week. So, um, you know, we're just doing everything that we can to keep our own kids safe. And I think they've, they've done a pretty good job of, you know, physical distancing themselves. You know, I, you know, I still see people walking past the playground and, and, or up on the football field. And I'm not, you know, I, I'm not here to be the police on that on that spot if they're not, you know, really interacting with a bunch of people. If there was a big group up there, I'd go say something. But if there's two or three kids up there, I'm just yeah. and most of them are already connected because they're because it's a brother or sister that are up there doing it. So, um, so yeah, we're not we're 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 still trying to take care of, you know, um, you know, our people. We're not letting people in the building. You know, we, unless they need to get something, uh, we do have a couple of, you know, like our the district office staff is still on in the building because of the payroll stuff and because of the, uh, you know, the nutrition you know, group and everything. Mm-hmm. They're also in the building just to make sure that we can get food to people and resources to people. But uh, a lot of people are working remotely at this point. Yeah. As from being in a county that once had zero cases and we now have approaching 8000, it wow. starts slow. People don't take it seriously. And it it explodes fast, and by the time it explodes fast, it is too late. Um, and we're doing better here in California, but man, at the beginning, everyone takes it lightly, and then you see, wow, you, you know, they announced 10 cases one day. Now it's up to they're announcing 700 cases yesterday in one day, 23 deaths. So we're obviously much more dense than Wisconsin, but um, it is serious stuff. Our interns just put out a, a video they did uh, about the importance of social distancing, taking it serious, and why they're doing it. So uh, I hope you guys are safe there and everyone's following yeah. through because it, it's scary. I think I think I, I believe that they are. I've, what I've seen more is that there's so many people out on the streets, right? And so many people out on the street in Fall Creek, Wisconsin. You're talking about 30 people. I mean, you're right. not, and they're not all together. They're just walking the streets mm-hmm. of, of, of Fall Creek. There's literally one. So I think that there's you know that's that's been I think we've we've definitely taken seriously in that regard, um, and we've just tried to keep everybody like out of the bigger areas where because school's the hub. This place is the hub of the community. Like this is the biggest building in town. It's where the most people work. It's the it's the it's it. So you know we're trying to keep people out of here specifically out of here if we can. Yeah, and I, I've done my two previous episodes on this podcast are. Uh, coronavirus communications for school. So we have a bunch of strategies and ideas that people can utilize as we go through this unprecedented time because nobody uh, went to school for this, took a class in Pandemic 101, and we're all kind of learning as we go, but it's amazing. Joe, I appreciate all the time. Any, how, do, how can people connect with you? Do you have anything coming up, any conferences, any books? How can we connect with you the best and uh, follow you? 
Yo, just keep checking out the Go Crickets hashtag, man. That's where our people are. That's who I believe in, and I'm just trying to shout them out as much as we can. But uh, but otherwise, you know, you know, on Twitter I'm at Joe underscore San Filippo, and actually I'm on all of the platforms at that. So feel free to reach out if there's anything that we can do to help you out or your school district out. Just let us know, and we're you know we're willing to do it. Our people are just crushing it, and they'll be they're more than willing to talk about how they're taking on the individual stories and. Uh, and hopefully we'll continue to do that and take care of kids. Joe, appreciate the time. I love the insights. I love, you know, your innovation, your power of communications, what it's doing for your students, your staff, your community. I think it's amazing. You put Fall Creek, Wisconsin on the map for sure in just such a positive way. So keep up the great work. Appreciate the time. Thanks for coming on the School PR Podcast. And I could talk for four more hours, but I'll let you go. Uh, enjoyed it for sure. Right. And hope, hopefully we catch up soon. All right, thanks a lot, Ryan. All right, go Crickets. Go Crickets. <laughs> All right, buddy, Saturday morning. Paul Crickets, Wisconsin. One minute walk to work, and here's what I'm thinking about today. So, tough week for Wisconsin with the announcement that buildings are going to be closed for the remainder of the year. So, it's never been more important for us to make sure that we stay connected to our families. You know, we've been starting our day reading stories and doing magic tricks on our Facebook page. And, and, and the magic tricks are awful. Let's be very clear about that. They are absolutely awful. And I'll get calls and texts and emails from kids when they're done. Or kids that want to FaceTime me and tell me that I'm not magic. They're like, you're not magic. I saw the string on that pencil. You're not magic. That ball didn't disappear. I saw you throw it. I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. Right? And I go back and forth with them. And then at the end of the conversation, I always say, all right, I'll see you tomorrow. I will see you tomorrow because it's not about the magic it's about doing something to make sure that we bring them back the next day and give parents 20 minutes to just kind of break away and relax and when I'm talking about parents I'm not just talking about the parents of our students we also have to understand that we have a number of staff members who have young kids at home and they're doing everything that they can to teach other people's kids while making sure that they can change the diapers of their own <laughs> right and there's been so many times in the last three weeks where I've been so fixated on making sure that our staff can see and hear the kids in their class that I neglected to understand that they needed the same. So the leadership challenge for next week is simply this. What are we doing to bring our people back the next day? What's that one moment, the call, the text, the I see you, I hear you moment, right? Parents and teachers don't need you to fix their current situation, but when you acknowledge that it exists, you create value for the work that they're doing to make the most of it, right? You don't have to drive across town and change a diaper, but you do have to recognize that it happens in between Zoom sessions. I need to be better there. Just got to take care of each other. All right, people, that's all I got. We're all staying together, man. Have a great week, everybody. Go Crickets. Hi, this is Rob Wiltsey, founder of Schoolshine. We make custom, professional-quality videos for school districts. We want to make sure your district has the very best video content possible and the best content strategy so you can get the most out of your videos. So check out some samples at schoolshine.org and schedule a call with us today to learn how you can take your videos to the next level. That's schoolshine.org. Do you wish that creating and sending email newsletters took less time and effort? Would you like more parents to tune in and read your district's newsletter? If so, try MarketVolt, the email newsletter platform tailored for districts like yours. With MarketVolt, it's simple to create newsletters that parents will read. MarketVolt automatically customizes your newsletter to match each parent's interest. With MarketVolt, you can create better newsletters with less headache and less hassle. Visit betterk12newsletter.com to learn what MarketVolt can do for you. That's betterk12newsletter.com, powered by MarketVolt. Hey there, PR experts. Blackboard here. School PR is about telling the story of your students, your teachers, and your school community. From websites and mass notifications to mobile presence and classroom engagement, Blackboard has the tools that you need. And whether you're a one-person shop or part of a bigger communication team, we can help you reach more people more effectively in less time. Thank you for all the work you do in improving education and helping students succeed. And thanks for letting us be a part of it.